welcome everyone to uh, to our fourth Ruskin lecture uh, for Kellogg College. My name's Rebecca Baxter and I look after development here. The first thing I'm going to say um, is just a bit of housekeeping actually, that this event is being recorded. Uh, so please feel free to have your camera on or off as you feel comfortable. We will be inviting questions at the end. And again, you'll only actually be visible on, on screen if your camera is on and you are talking, but just that little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, so, um, since the bicentenary of John Ruskin's birth four years ago, Kellogg has held an annual Ruskin lecture as a celebration of the friendship that existed between the writer, artist and social reformer and the original resident of number 62 Banbury Road, the clergyman and artist, the Reverend Richard St. John Tirrett. Ruskin was eight years older than Tirrett and clearly something of a hero for the younger man. And the two corresponded for two decades. And in 1872, the same year that um, Ruskin took up residence at Brantwood, uh, Ruskin would even write the preface to one of Tirrett's books on uh, Christian art and symbolism. And so I am very delighted this year to welcome Ruskin expert and the director of Brantwood, Howard Hull, who will be talking to Kellogg Fellow and architectural historian Geoffrey Tyak. We'll be throwing the floor open to you at the end for any questions. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Howard and Geoffrey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, it's an enormous pleasure to be involved in these Ruskin lectures. I sometimes think that although we're a very secular institution at Kellogg College, Ruskin is our patron saint. And he wasn't always a very saintly man, but he was fascinated by religion. In fact, he was fascinated by everything and was, of course, brought up in a strongly evangelical tradition. But that's not what we're talking about um, this evening. We're talking about um, Brantwood, um, which I'm one of the people who has actually been to see and if you haven't been to Brantwood, I'm sure by the end of Howard's talk, you will want to go there. Um, and I'm going to start off, actually, um, Howard, by um, asking you why Ruskin bought Brantwood um, and why did he buy it when he did in 1872? Well, Amazingly, actually, Brantwood uh, was the first home that Ruskin himself ever purchased uh, or, or owned, indeed, properly, because he grew up um, very much in the bosom of his family and uh, lived in homes uh, that either belonged to his parents um, or when he moved out that they had bought for him in London. Uh, and so um, it was an opportunity when they died. Um, uh, when his mother died, his father died three years early, but when his mother died, it was an opportunity for him uh, to actually look around and actually buy the sort of home that he really wanted. Uh, one has to understand that Ruskin was phenomenally um, popular in the 1870s, that he had become a real celebrity. His lectures were um, uh, sort of famous, really. Uh, the, his inaugural lecture at Oxford, for instance, um, uh, garnered nearly 2,000 attendees, and they had to abandon uh, the planned venue and go to the schools in order to, um, uh, to the Sheldonian, rather, in order to accommodate everybody who'd come for the lecture. So Ruskin was just ex extremely under pressure, really, you could say, and he wanted to escape um, celebrity. He wanted to get back to a simpler lifestyle. Above all, he wanted to connect again with nature, to, with the natural world that had inspired him as a young man. When Ruskin was a child, he had traveled a great deal in the Lake District with, on family trips. Uh, and indeed, we know that at the age of 18, he sat uh, in the field below Brantwood and drew the view opposite. Um, so he knew uh, where Brantwood was, he knew the lake, um, that it uh, is above, and he knew the mountains uh, opposite. Ruskin, of course, 
in his lifetime as an artist and as somebody deeply interested in geology, um, was fascinated with mountains and mountain landscapes and spent a lot of time in the Alps. So when he was thinking about where he might move, in fact, his first thought was that he would go and live in the Alps. Uh, and he bought a patch of land above, um, really on the slopes of Mont Blanc, uh, above Chamonix, uh, and intended to build there. But his friends thought he was completely mad to go uh, somewhere such altitude and uh, uh, exposure to the weather persuaded him that he should stay in England. And it was at that point that he was offered Brantwood by Brantwood's prior resident, uh, one William Linton. Brantwood has a sort of history really of housing uh, rather radical figures. And uh, Linton was a radical chartist, um, a Republican who published his uh, pa uh, sort of pamphlets at Brantwood. Uh, and so, uh, but it had become unbearable for Linton to continue to live in, in, in a monarchy, a country that was a monarchy, and he wanted to get to a republic uh, and emigrated to America and offered Brantwood to Ruskin. Uh, Ruskin actually had never been in the house itself and without seeing it, knowing the view that it had of the mountains, he purchased it in 1871. And uh, it was little more than a shed of rotten stones and wood, he said. Um, and he set about uh, making work on it, uh, and it was ready for him in September 1872. So 1872 was when Ruskin moved into Brampton. Fine. Um, well, that, that sets the, um, the, the scene very well. Um, I imagine some of you um, would have seen Brantwood, some of the audience, and those of you who haven't um, would have seen um, the Lake District, and in particular Lake Coniston, which it looks out over towards Coniston Old Man. So you need to keep that in your mind. But um, also, although he went there, um, Ruskin still um, had strong ties to Oxford. And I think this is something that we can um, think about a lot. He'd been a, a student, of course, at Oxford. Um, and um, in a way, he came back. He had a second career, perhaps. I don't know whether Howard uh, would agree with that. Um, and I was wondering, Howard, whether you could tell us a little bit about how he divided his time um, between, um, be be between Oxford and Brantwood, and in fact, London, if he um, went there at all. Um, and what did Brantwood actually mean to him? How did it inspire him? Why, in a sense, why Brantwood and what Brantwood does to Ruskin in the last, well, it's getting on for 30 years of his life, actually. Ruskin had suffered from um, uh, a number of, uh, of what we might call uh, minor episodes of potential mental illness. Um, actually, uh, first of all, when he was a student at Oxford, um, and in fact, he never finished his degree at Oxford because his parents um, had to take him away um, traveling to sort of recuperate uh, from, the, uh, fr from, from the problems that he'd encountered. And um, uh, in later years, Ruskin uh, had one, two other episodes. And he said to a friend um, in, a, in a letter uh, in 1870, uh, 1871, uh, if I could lie down in Coniston water, um, I would be well. Uh, he was remembering the experience of having been in Coniston uh, in uh, you know some forty years earlier, uh, and the uh, experience of that landscape as a sort of healing place was something that was clearly deeply uh, inside Ruskin's uh, heart, and so the move to Brantwood was very much conditioned, I think, um, by uh, the possibility that the reuniting with the tradition of of, of nature as he had first encountered it, particularly under the sort of wing, if you like, of the sort of romantics, romantic art, uh, uh, poetry of Wordsworth and the like, um, and his own experience of actually being out in nature. So, so Brantwood had a sort of potential to, he felt to sort of heal him, to make him whole. That was terribly important. It was very important for him to reconnect with the sources of his inspiration. Um, after a long period in which he'd been very much concerned with social affairs. Uh, 
the other thing is that when Ruskin was appointed uh, in 1870 as Slade Professor of Fine Art at Oxford, um, he was uh, given the opportunity, as it were, to come back to Oxford, uh, this time as a sort of learned professor, um, to uh, talk about, in particular, uh, his love of art. But, but Ruskin being Ruskin, uh, wanted to, as it were, touch upon everything else. Um, and uh, for Ruskin, art embraced everything, um, and therefore nothing um, was, uh, as it were, to be excluded in terms of the things that he wanted his students to look at. Um, so it was that actually Brantwood became a sort of think space for Ruskin um, for the lectures that he was delivering at Oxford. Um, uh, so much so that actually he brought his students from Oxford up to Brantwood to help um, uh, develop some of his uh, landscaping ideas. I'll touch on those maybe a, a little bit separately later, but what I think was really important for Ruskin was that Oxford gave him uh, the opportunity to, um, uh, to connect with, once again, with a lot of the latest thinking in terms of the sciences, in terms of geological sciences in particular, he was very interested in geology, um, to, uh, as it were, tap the sort of into the knowledge of the many different academics that were there and to be in company of people who were uh, his intellectual equals and indeed in, in some cases his betters. And the, um, uh, he got involved at Oxford while he was Ox at Oxford with the plans for the museum uh, of um, uh, the, uh, natural history. Uh, and uh, that was a terribly important uh, association uh, and one, of course, in which Tirrit um, features as well. Uh, Ruskin's lectures were, became, quickly became famous for their sort of colour. Um, but one of the things that Ruskin was doing at, Ox at Brantwood was that he was taking on increasing level of involvement in the landscape around him. In other words, Brantwood has an estate uh, of today of about 200 acres. Uh, in Ruskin's time, it swelled to about uh, 500 acres. And Ruskin saw it as a sort of, best way to, to think of it is that he saw it as a type of laboratory uh, in which he could explore and experiment with different types of intervention in landscape um, to understand the relationship of proper husbandry um, uh, of the land and our relationship to nature. And he drew upon all those activities uh, and his experience of landscaping there um, to uh, talk to his students about uh, their relationship with nature, both relationship of, of, of humanity to nature, but also of the, science, the relationship of our view of nature through the sciences as well as through the arts. So it was a sort of, it was, it was a place where he could experiment, think and write and prepare for the lectures in Oxford. Um, in, in the 1850s, uh, Coniston had been blessed with a railway because it's also a mining town. And um, the, the, the train last departed Coniston Station in, in 1960s, so uh, it's not there today. But in Ruskin's time, it was there. And he was able to actually take the train to Oxford. Uh, it was about an eight hour trip. Uh, but that made life a little easier for him in terms of commuting because it would take two to three weeks if he decided to go by uh, by coach, uh, as he did on a couple of occasions. So his travel into Oxford was regular. Um, uh, it meant there were protracted periods away from Brantwood um, when he was at Oxford or in London. Ruskin had always been a big European traveller. Uh, and he didn't stop traveling to Europe, um, so that he also departed on trips to Venice um, uh, and uh, other parts of Italy and France. All of those things meant that the engagement with Brantwood was often episodic. Um, you know, he'd be away for some months, he'd come back, and then uh, he would develop a project there. Um, the, the landscaping of Brantwood went alongside the development of the building itself. One of the um, 
pictures which uh, for you tonight uh, shows Brantwood as drawn by Ruskin in 1872. And you can see that it's just the sort of shoebox of a, of a cottage. It started life as an 18th century um, uh, cottage, quite small and modest. Um, Ruskin then added a turret on the corner of the house, um, which enabled it to become something of an observatory. And uh, he used that turret as a sort of window upon the weather, upon cloud formations, about changes in the weather. And he recorded those on a daily basis. Um, uh, it played a very important role in Ruskin's mind because Ruskin felt increasingly that Brantwood was, as it were, surrounded by the threat of uh, industrialization that was in the rest of Lancashire um, uh, and, uh, and, and increasingly uh, encroaching upon the boundaries of, 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 of the Lake District. Uh, it was um, therefore in a sort of way, um, uh, Brentwood became something of a fortress as well. Um, it became a place which defended him uh, from the powers of, uh, of laissez-faire capitalism, uh, of industrialization and the threats that came with it. And these were symbolized for Ruskin in particular through changes in the climate that he observed. Mm. Um, and indeed in 1884, uh, he published an important uh, uh, lecture that he'd given at the Royal Society uh, on climate change. And it's one of the first truly prophetic writings on climate change. It's called the storm cloud of the 19th century. And it's based upon a drawing that Ruskin made from the turret of Brantwood, looking across at the mountain, the old man of Coniston, uh, enveloped in sort of mists and cloud. Ruskin was increasingly concerned with pollution, um, with uh, uh, the advent of uh, steam power in his day, um, uh, uh, and uh, the railways, um, reducing people's relationship to nature and to the natural world. Um, at Brantwood, he had a sort of uh, paradise, a place that he could um, uh, come. This is uh, Brantwood as drawn by Ruskin in 1872. Um, and you get some sort of sense of, sense of it there. Good. Well, th thank you very much. Um, oh, here we've got another picture of it. Here you see it today. Um, and you can just make out the cottage uh, in the... Um, uh, at, the, at the front, you know, on the left-hand side of the, of the house. Um, one of the things to, I might just say this now, I've got this picture up because it's, it just helps to put it in perspective today, is that it started life as an 18th century cottage. Ruskin added um, the little pavilion that's in front of it there that has the row of windows. Um, and you can just make out the turret on the corner of the of, of this. This is all on the left-hand side of what is, appears to be a very large building. But in 1878, um, that occurrence of the uh, mental problems that Ruskin had, uh, had encountered in an earlier stage um, came back and they came back with a vengeance. And he had quite a severe breakdown in, the, um, in 1878. And he wasn't really able to look after himself. He invited his cousin, Joan Seven, to come and look after him. Uh, Joan was uh, expecting her first child, uh, newly married, so she brought her family with her uh, and um, Brantwood became her home as well. Uh, that meant that uh, the cottage was far too small to accommodate them all. She went on to have five children, so it became quite a family home. Uh, and that's why Brantwood is as big as it is today. Ruskin never really departed the use of the front of the house. Uh, so the rooms of the house really divide into sort of two areas. It's the area that Ruskin, of the old cottage, which Ruskin um, inhabited, most of his possessions are still there. And that's what visitors go around today and gives them a truly uh, wonderful experience of a sort of sense of him uh, uh, in the house, uh, surrounded by the things that he loved. But, the fact that the house looks very big from that elevation um, is because really basically it was it added to during Ruskin's lifetime, but by Joan and her family. Good. 
Well, th thank you very much for that. I was going to um, ask you about Ruskin's views on art and nature, but in fact, you answered a lot of those already. I just thought I'd interject before we get on to um, number 62, Banbury Road, um, about Ruskin and politics, because mm -hmm. Of course, he was a prophetic writer in many ways. He was a critic of um, their ablative fair, as you said. Would you just like to say something about Ruskin and politics in this last part of his life, the last 30 years? Yes, I mean, Ruskin, um, I mean, in a way you just need to sort of, you need to sort of slightly go back um, to Ruskin's extraordinary transformation as a public figure, from being a, an art critic uh, and an architectural uh, writer on art and architecture, to uh, in 1860 um, publishing four essays in the Cornhill magazine on the political economy. It had been brewing for a long time in Ruskin, but uh, and 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 the and, and writings on architecture had contained social philosophy, but in 1860. Uh, he actually wrote um, what was finally gathered together in, in a series of four essays called Unto This Last, a, a, ser a, a, a stinging critique of laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, and that little booklet uh, was the one that went on to influence Mahatma Gandhi, for instance, uh, and, and his revolution in India. Um, uh, many of the founders of the uh, English Labour Party, the British Labour Party, um, uh, the founding of the welfare state and lots of social programs that are familiar through the 20th century. Um, the, uh, the opportunity to put his ideas into practice really came when he inherited his father's money. Until that point, in a way, Ruskin was a thinker and a writer, um, not a man of action. But when he inherited his father's money, um, he became extraordinarily rich. And this wealth sat on, on the shoulders of a man who had just published an essay, which ends with the words, um, there is no wealth but life. Um, uh, and for Ruskin, it was, uh, a, um, it, it was a sort of duty, uh, self-imposed, uh, that he should use that wealth uh, and distribute that wealth in different ways in order to, um, to, 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 to make the best for humanity. Uh, and one of the ways in which he set about doing that was to um, endow various colleges, the, the School of Drawing and Fine Art at Oxford uh, was a college that he set up. Um, uh, he established um, a museum in Sheffield for working met people. And he established a thing called the Guild of St. George. Now, the Guild of St. George was a, an association of individuals um, of means who were able to uh, tithe a proportion of their income or their wealth uh, to a common cause to purchase land uh, and facilities uh, in order that tenant farmers could have security of tenure um, and, 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 and decent sort of uh, decent rents. Uh, Ruskin gradually expanded that, he expanded the operations of the Guild, and the Guild is still going today uh, with uh, an important array of social, uh, social programmes uh, uh, and applying Ruskin's ideas. But the thing about all of these things was that Ruskin was trying to move into being, uh, to applying his ideas. What he also wanted to do was to choose projects which would themselves be in some way exemplary so that they would inspire others to go on and, 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 and do things. So, for instance, at Oxford, uh, he went out um, with his students and uh, undertook a project to widen the road in North Hinksey. Um, uh, at that time, Hinksey was somewhat cut off um, and the road through the village was muddy, uh, narrow, and, 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 and unfit for purpose. Ruskin took his students, uh, and there's a famous engraving of them, uh, work all in their cricket whites uh, in a sort of sea of mud, um, uh, attempting to widen the, the road. Ruskin himself 
admitted that it was probably the worst road in the three counties, but that nonetheless, um, uh, it went, it, it inspired a lot of people. Uh, Ruskin had a way of sort of hitting on things that um, became like parables, if you like. Um, and uh, amongst the people um, in uh, his student group were Oscar Wilde, um, one, but uh, also uh, Arnold Toynbee. And Toynbee's interest in social philosophy grew at that point. Um, and through a set of uh, conversations and relationships, um, uh, after Toynbee's untimely death, uh, Toynbee Hall was founded in the East End of London to undertake a whole lot of very Ruskinian social programs with the poor, the poor of the East End of London and things like that. So you sort of begin to see this sort of span of interest and, and, and influence from Ruskin. But one of the other big projects that he had and possibly um, the most interesting was that he published a letter to the working men or the working people of Great Britain um, on a regular basis. This letter was quite a long letter, it's really a pamphlet, um, uh, and um, it came out uh, in multiple editions, about the, I think, 84 letters. They're collected together uh, in, a, in a publication called Fors Clavigera, um, but the, uh, uh, not exactly a title uh, that the average working person of Great Britain would necessarily have made much of. Um, but the letters are very interesting because they're like a sort of computer blog. Um, uh, they actually take other people's views into account. They bring them in, correspondence that he's had from people, um, uh, cuttings from newspapers and so forth, uh, and, wo and weaves them together. And they're full of social philosophy and, uh, and ideas about uh, the nature of changing a society. Mm. Well, thank you. I, I really like that analogy between Paul Sklavitra and the computer blog, because if you start reading these letters, you just jump from one thing to another. Um, and I really um, would recommend that any of you to re read them um, in an anthology, preferably, rather than try and <laughs> go through the whole lot, um, because they are so enlightening and very relevant to our own times and our own troubles. Um, so let's move move away from um, Ruskin as a philosopher to um, to Oxford and um, number 62 Banbury Road mm. and we know that uh, Ruskin visited um, his friend the Reverend Tirith who was the vicar of St Mary Magdalene several times and we here at Kellogg are about to launch a campaign to transform the gardens um, some of you might say which gardens well <laughs> <laughs> eventually they will be um, wonderful gardens to a scheme and uh, conceived by the garden designer Andy Sturgeon who has indeed taken Ruskin as his inspiration for the designs and I think you have seen some of these. Um, I have, yes. So I, I wonder if you how it could characterise um, Ruskin's approach to gardens and landscaping. Well, first off, just to congratulate um, uh, the college on on, on imaginative uh, uh, response to the, you know to, to 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 its property and to the student need, I think it's a wonderful idea that this garden's uh, being proposed and and and, uh, and wish it every success. I'm sure it will be a wonderful uh, enhancement of the, of the college and its uh, its environs and and much appreciated by the students. Ruskin. Um, as I said, had uh, a fairly substantial estate uh, surrounding Brantwood and it gave him the first opportunity that he really ever had uh, to actually be his own gardener or his own landscaper. Um, uh, Ruskin's philosophy relating to, uh, to this, it's all about the responsibilities of our care for the environment. It's about husbandry. For Ruskin is, um, is by nature in one sense an, an interventionist, uh, he believed that um, we are here uh, to find common cause with nature, to live with nature as part of nature in a um, uh, in balance and in harmony and in a sustainable fashion. Um, and that nature knew best. Nature was the great teacher. Uh, and that therefore, um, in the garden, uh, what we are doing is that we are finding 
our relationship with nature because he believed that nature treated well would treat us well but that tra nature treated poorly would treat us poorly um, it's uh, what often uh, i call his theory of thistles um, ruskin very specifically shows that when plants are treated uh, grow on rough ground or treated badly um, uh, that they um, become malevolent towards uh, uh, people you know, as they become spiky um, uh, thistles uh, you know put out their spikes points plants become poisonous um, it is of course not a, um, a this isn't a botanical truth uh, in and of itself um, but it's an important um, nonetheless it's an important uh, parable again uh, in terms of understanding how Ruskin saw nature as something that we could work and live in harmony with. He also believed in gardening terms that um, it was important to use native plants wherever possible. Um, Brantwood is a uh, is, 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 is interesting because Joan was also a gardener, Joan's cousin who had moved in, uh, was also a gardener. She couldn't really abide Ruskin's um, uh, sort of um, uh, philosophical approach and, and was uh, very keen to put in a lot of, uh, of the sorts of plants that, um, that Ruskin himself would eschew. So Brantwood actually has both, but in very distinct and different sort of places within the, within the grounds. So there are some sort of magnificent um, uh, rhododendrons and uh, azaleas and aces and the like, um, which Joan had planted, um, and some big landscaping exercises. At the same time, uh, there are uh, some beautiful um, wilder areas. Brantwood is very heavily wooded, um, and Ruskin did create a very important garden as an entrance to the landscape. Um, this is the zigzaggy garden at Brantwood. The zigzaggy garden is an allegorical garden that Ruskin created, um, which uh, is based on the Purgatorial Mount in Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. And the idea of the zigzaggy garden is that it is, um, it is of course, a living out of the, um, uh, of the approach to paradise. Uh, by the shedding of the seven deadly sins and the embrace of the seven graces. And, and so each of the terraces that you encounter as you go up this zigzag path are symbolically representative of the different seven deadly sins. Um, so you'll have pride, for instance, where all the plants are very large and blousy and big. Um, you'll have avarice where the plants are little, uh, little tiny seeds of yellow in the mossy ground, um, representing the gold that the avaricious weep for the loss of, um, and so forth. So the garden uh, is a gateway to Ruskin's estate. And the idea of it is that Ruskin had become very interested in the idea of um, terracing in mountain gardens, um, uh, and indeed in mountain areas. And he wanted to give a lecture at the Royal Society uh, in, uh, in which he had um, talked about the idea of uh, the importance of terracing in Britain's mountain areas in order to improve the soil quality, in order to retain the um, nutrients. Uh, so he took a very, very, a very uh, direct interest in landscaping um, in order to enrich uh, the environment, um, both for agriculture but also for um, uh, horticulture and, uh, and, and just gardens for pleasure. Ruskin created another garden um, at Brantwood, which is called the Professor's Garden, which is a laboratory garden in which he explored uh, the whole idea of companion planting. Uh, Ruskin had developed uh, what he called the law of help. Um, that is to say the idea that nature is naturally collaborative rather than uh, competitive and that uh, when it collaborates, it creates environments of mutual, mutually sustaining advantage. Um, it avails towards life. And Ruskin um, uh, saw this as something of great importance in the way in which he approached uh, gardening at, Br at Brantwood. 
he realized that native plants are already adapted naturally um, to this because they have learned to accommodate each other uh, in a mutually advantageous environment. Uh, and, uh, and that's how they survived. So he would, um, he would favor them above all. Uh, some of the planting you see here is not, of course, uh, British native planting. Um, and that's because uh, you've got Joan Seven's great uh, rhododendron sort of down uh, uh, towards the bottom there. Um, and you've got plants that have been introduced precisely because they are, um, uh, they are part of the seven deadly sins, um, is the best way to put it. They represent choices of pride rather than choices uh, of generosity. Um, so Ruskin had a, an idea, a thought behind all the gardens that he created at Brownwood. We have seven, um, what one might call sort of distinct gardens that are dotted around in amongst the woodlands and on the slopes of Brantwood. And I think this business of having different, different places in gardens is very strong. Um, and, and I did like in, 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 in the plans that Andy's drawn up for Kellogg, um, very much his response to the different places, the different areas and creating these distinct uh, areas, all of which have different purposes. So they're gardens that actually do have purpose um, uh, and, the, and, 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 and the sort of theme to them. And I think that that's very much the way that Ruskin uh, approached the landscaping at, uh, at Brantwood. Um, that each of these uh, has a different sort of uh, a different role, if you like. Um, uh, but together, they form a sort of ha a harmonious sort of whole. Hmm. Well, thank you. That's um, I, we're nearly out of our time, but I did just want to um, bring up that word sustain and sustainability, because this is a word that, as we all know, is much banded around today, although I'm not sure everybody always agrees on what we mean by it. Um, could you just a final remark, say, what can we learn from Ruskin um, about understanding sustainability in the modern world, which is challenged uh, as much as it was in his time, if not more so. I'm going to go back to something I was just talking about, the law of help, and I'm going to say that um, Ruskin wrote the law of help when he was actually started out by looking at composition in pictures. And um, what he learned from looking at composition in pictures was he looked at the idea that in a picture, a, a well-composed picture, um, you see the help of everything in the picture by everything else. In other words, there's nothing you can take out of it that won't weaken it as a whole, um, that everything is mutually um, uh, supportive of everything else. He went further to actually say that in every atom of it, it is kind. And I think that's a beautiful phrase because it indicates the idea that we have a certain, that we have love for um, our fellow man, for our fellow uh, uh, fellow creation around us um, and that uh, and that we have kindness towards it and I think that the, it, it shows that fundamentally um, to be sustainable we have to have uh, that spirit in our hearts it's not just good enough to say we want to survive um, what we want is to survive well and we want others to survive well we want each other uh, to survive well and that means we want the world around us to survive well. That's how we have to approach it. It's a, it's a whole unity um, uh, and, 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 and a spirit and, and generosity of heart. Um, Ruskin uh, talked of heart sight um, and uh, uh, he never talks just of beauty, he always talks of vital beauty. These are important elisions really uh, in terms of Ruskin's way of looking at the world. And I think that uh, without them, just an entirely mechanistic sort of attitude to sustainability um, won't work because if we don't change things in our heart, we won't want to make the sacrifices and changes um, positive for people uh, that we need to in order to, to make it happen. Mm, thank you. Well, that's something I think that could inspire all of us. Um, Rebecca, are, are you going to host the questions or are you just going to ask <laughs> people to um, post them up and then we can um, go on from there. 
Yes, so um, thank you, first of all, thank you so very much. How fascinating. Every time I hear about Ruskin, I just realise how much more there is to learn. Mm. Um, so yes, anyone who has questions, you can sort of wave at me. You can, and I see Robert waving. Excellent, Robert. Um, you can put up your electronic hand and you can also put your questions in the chat. We will get round to as many of you as possible. But uh, Robert, I see you waving. So if you want to unmute yourself. Um, thank you very much, Howard. Um, wonderful lecture. Very good to see you again after that World Heritage Site trip to Italy. Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> yes. remember. I do. <laughs> and, um, and good to see you too, Jeffrey, my old tutor. <laughs> um, um, Howard, uh, you mentioned Ruskin's rather contradictory view. Well, you, you, you mentioned his use of the railways, mm. and then you mentioned his horror of industrialization, and I think particularly of the arrival of the viaduct and the railway line to Venice. Mm. Now, th there's a paradox there, I think, isn't there, in, the, in, the, in Ruskin's personality, where he made use of the technology of the 19th century, but he, he wrote about it as if it was a deplorable thing. Yeah, absolutely right. Of course, he did say to, uh, that he, if he hadn't contradicted himself at least seven times before mm. breakfast. He didn't really think <laughs> he was alive. Um, and, uh, and, and he's full of contradictions. Um, but I think honestly so. And I think that what Ruskin particularly understood was that we all live, uh, in, if you like, in, in, in a compromised state with regard to what we actually um, are our ideals. Um, and Ruskin himself was no exception to that. I mean, he was a man who was wealthy, who was uh, privileged, who, um, you know, who had had everything laid on a plate for him by his father. Um, uh, he poked fun at himself. He used himself, as it, as it were, as, a, um, as an example often uh, of, uh, of, of the problem that he's talking about. Um, and I think that that... That was his way of dealing with that. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we take aeroplanes, we we get in cars and talk about our carbon footprint. You know, we're all um, uh, do that because because we're in the midst of the time that has the problem. We're part of that. We can't extract ourselves um, conveniently from it. Um, uh, and uh, I think Ruskin, yes, he was idealistic in, in wanting to return um, to a world, a simpler world, um, which of course, no doubt, if he got to it, would not have been as simple as he thought it was. Um, but I think he wanted to use the, um, uh, the, no the knowledge of that. Um, he wanted to explore it so that he might find something deeper about, our you know, about about, um, as I said, what's in our heart and, and how we might think about life and what we might do for each other. Um, but yes, he was uh, full of contradictions. <laughs> May I have a short, very short supplementary? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so that, that failure to reconcile the things he liked with the things he didn't like, um, in what way does that um, give us a, a path for uh, the way we think about things. You know, I, I'm reminded of, say, Morris writing in News from Nowhere. Mm. Morris is choosing an, an, an ideal world to set his characters in. And I mm. imagine, like to think that Ruskin would have been very happy in that, um, <laughs> in that, in that uh, Morris, uh, Morris vision of England post-industrial uh, collapse. Uh, what's your view on that? I think, um, to try and keep this brief, I think the thing is that, that Ruskin wasn't um, a utopian. He's often painted as a utopian, but I don't believe he was. Um, uh, I think Ruskin was much more pragmatic and realistic about the nature of things. Um, and he recognised that oftentimes things would have to sit side by side. Um, uh, I think he also realised that it was about achieving certain types of balance and that um, therefore what you would be, um, what you'd be championing 
you might champion fully, but not on the basis that you expected it to be fully, uh, fully accepted or fully taken up. Um, I mean, in a way, Ruskin's own gardens are that because he allows his cousin using his money um, to do an enormous amount of, uh, of gardening, which is the antithesis of the type of gardening that he himself would want to do. But he doesn't complain about it. <laughs> he, and, and he loves her. And it's what she wants to do. Um, and so Brantwood has both. Um, and it sort of isn't any poorer for it, really. Um, it's, it's an accommodation. And I suppose that he, that, you know, you can be critical of accommodations because, of course, they can be a weakness. But at the same time, they also can be a way of achieving balance and harmony. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask our audience if anyone uh, has any other question for Howard before I jump in with one of my own. So is anyone sort of just sitting on a question that they really want to have answered? If not, Howard, may I ask you a question? <laughs> and that is, um, obviously, Brantwood, I mean, I haven't been there, but I've, I've, I've seen uh, pictures of it, and it clearly sits in just the most idyllic position on Lake Coniston. And I'm just wondering, did that provide um, artistic uh, inspiration for Ruskin, i.e. Did he, did he actually paint, paint it a mm. lot or sketch or, you know, how did it inspire him in that way? Right. Well, it came relatively late in Ruskin's uh, artistic life. Um, mm. uh, so um, Ruskin did paint it um, and he painted, he, he produced one or two really beautiful watercolours of, um, of, of, the, of the scene of the mountain, you know, uh, uh, with a dawn catching the light, with the, mm. with the uh, mist rising from the water and so forth. So there are some beautiful paintings by Ruskin, but not a huge number of them, not nearly as many as he took, as he made of the Alps, for instance. Mm. Um, but Ruskin was very, very busy painting in a different way at Brantwood because he was writing three important books on the natural world. Um, one on, on, on geology, one on botany, and one on ornithology. And he was illustrating those books, um, but more diagrammatically or with more specific sort of uh, purposes. He also did produce some beautiful pictures which were used for the lectures in Oxford uh, and for the drawing school at Oxford. And they're all in the Ashmolean. So one of the finest collections of Ruskin's uh, late watercolours is really at the Ashmolean and so you're all very well positioned to go along and, 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 and see them. Uh, so Ruskin's inspiration of the landscape at, uh, at, at uh, Brantwood is more uh, pragmatic, I suppose, more uh, practical and more educational based than it is artistic at that point in his life. Um, Thank you. I can see that um, we have uh, Helen with her electronic hand up. So I think we're going to perhaps take Helen's question as our final question, um, because I can see that we're likely to run out of time. So Helen, may I invite you to, to ask your question, please? Um, yes, um, good evening. Um, really interesting um, lecture talk. Um, I've been going to Brentwood for many years and I go up to the Lake District quite regularly. But I actually live in Stratford upon Avon, so I can get to Oxford quite easily as well. Um, what I was going to ask is um, the, I know more about Brentwood, the building and the gardens, and I do about Ruskin, but I'm slowly increasing my knowledge here. But um, is there any, any mileage in, in all the work that? all the things that, and the beliefs that of Ruskin about basically what's happening now with climate change and, you know, working in balance with nature, which is what we haven't done. Um, have you got any plans to do um, an exhibition about that? Um, you know, to sort of, uh, I don't know, 
there's people who say nothing happening, but they get a lot of visitors at Brentwood. It might be quite a, it might be quite um, an interesting exhibition, and people could sort of say, oh well, you know, if Ruskin believed that we needed to be in balance with nature, then you know, perhaps we ought to think more about it. Well, it's uh, it's almost like you were asked to, to ask that question, but uh, I'm glad you did because. Uh, um, because actually the answer is yes, uh, we are, um, we're planning this year, uh, three exhibitions in a row in the Blue Gallery at Brantwood on Ruskin, the, the, the overall theme is Ruskin and science, but the actual themes, the first one is on Ruskin and skies, it's called the skies are for all, which was Ruskin's own phrase, the skies are for all Ruskin um, and the clouds of climate change. And it's about Ruskin's writings and drawings and diagrams relating to climate change. We're doing it in association with the Royal Society, who are providing uh, loans to us of work done on climate by other uh, important Victorian uh, uh, scientists and climatologists. So the so we're certainly looking at it like that. The other side is that we um, we may know that at Brantwood in the old stables we have uh, we have a cafe on the ground floor there, but the, but up above we have the hayloft, and that hayloft is being converted at the moment into a uh, into an environment centre for the estate. So the idea is very much that we will use it as a centre for environmentally sort of focused activities and to try and also communicate to people that in looking after the estate, we adopt a lot of um, significant sort of practices uh, in terms of the way that we look after the estate and why we do them and explaining, you know, some of them are very traditional uh, rural crafts. Some of them are um, uh, in more sort of uh, environmentally related to do with the ecology of the estate and supporting supporting its rare uh, have, um, species and so forth. So, so the answer is that there's quite a lot, but there's never you could never do enough, um, that's for sure. Um, it's, a, it's an important subject. And we're in a way finding our, finding our way with it. I think that's the thing. So we want to involve people in what, we're, what our aspirations are. And um, uh, Brentwood's a slightly complicated place because it's so remote um, in one sense. Uh, it's, 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 it's not on the road to anywhere in particular. Um, you have to. Why I like it. <laughs> yes, indeed, it's its beauty, but it is also slightly. It's, um, I, it's I stay at a little place um, just at um, just in Lowick Bridge. So mm. I I use the um, the little what single track road to get yeah. up because it's it's so much quicker than going up to Torbo and Lower. Sure. But, um, if you've not been it. Apart from anything else, they sell the most wonderful cakes and, and, and there's a wonderful view from the terrace overlooking the lake when, when, it, when it's not um, raining or blowing a day. Never rains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking forward to coming up again um, in, in actually in April. So um, will the exhibition be on by then? It, it, it opens on the 7th of April. Oh, great. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, so you have you have one customer for that exhibition at the good. very yeah. least. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Um, oh, somebody is just saying hello there, Anthony. Someone's just saying I had the opportunity in 2018 to visit Brantwood, um, and it's a beautiful house and spectacular setting. So, yeah, I think a recommendation to us all, apart from the lovely cakes, clearly. Very, so it's a, <laughs> very, 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 very important. Howard, it's, it's, it's been so wonderful to have you with us this evening to, to, to tell us so much more about, well, Brantwood and, and, and Ruskin. Um, I feel I've learned so much. And of course, to, to Geoffrey as well, um, for, for asking the questions. So I think um, we're at five to six, unless anyone has a, a burning final question, I will thank you both very, very much and um, thank all of our audience as well and, and wish you a very good evening. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for asking me.
If oh, I, no, absolute I'm, pleasure. I'm allowed to interject. Um, I'd like to um, give my own thanks for that really superb um, talk. I think we've all learned a lot. And um, can I just urge you not only to go to Brandwood, <laughs> also to read Ruskin, because <laughs> um, he touches on so many things that um, concern us today. Um, and I think if you do that, um, you will be very stimulated and challenged. And that's mm. really what a lot of this is about. So thank you very much, Howard, for um, sharing your insights with us. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Rebecca. No, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you very much.